Come back to order, please, and everyone take a seat. And we're running about a half an hour behind, so we're going to have to do some shifting into the afternoon. Uh, probably shifting lunch and shifting the workshop to start a little later, and we'll announce that at the end of this next talk, so that you'll have. Uh, a good sense of where, how much time you have over lunch and, and when to be back here for the a wonderful afternoon workshop with Todd Seiler. Um, one thing about, for those of you on the committee and those of you who are invited speakers, I think I've gotten to all of you, but our plans are materializing for dinner tonight. Uh, we're planning to leave here and go down to uh, Hickory Park, which is a real popular local place that uh, shouldn't be too busy at that time of the day, although you never know, uh, for some barbecued meat and uh, uh, no vegetarian things, I think, at, at Hickory Park. Uh, and, uh, and then from there, we're, uh, I think I've talked to all of you, but we have an invitation to a little wind-down party uh, at my house. So if I haven't talked to a member of the committee or the invited speakers, we're going to try to wind this thing down uh, in the early evening so you can all get a good night's sleep and make those early morning flights tomorrow. Um, we wanted to do, introduce one person to you. I think you've probably met her because she's been ubiquitous here uh, off on the sidelines. She likes to be often hidden, but we made her come up here. This is Molly Helmers. And, uh, and good, I'm glad you gave her a round of applause because that was my next comment was please give her. So I'm glad it was so spontaneous. I didn't have to even provoke it. Anyway, we wanted to give Molly something because quite frankly, Folks, you wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for Molly. <laughs> I would have sunk long ago. Uh, but Molly did so much work for this conference. She helped me so much organize it. She handled all the financial things with one of the secretaries over in our building. I just don't have any ability to do that. I mean, it's like you can't imagine how chaotic this would have been if it had happened at all if it hadn't been for Molly. And she did it not because she had to. It wasn't really part of her job. Uh, they gave us the grant from CAH. And then she's done it out of the goodness of her heart and the interest in what we're doing and an interest of you folks having a good time. So to honor that, um, I purchased a copy of Think Like a Genius. Now, she already, she already thinks like a genius, but as Todd will tell you, she, you can always do better, right, Todd? Right. So we have an autographed copy by Todd and by the two of us, and uh, so she'll always remember how much we appreciated her efforts. And I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our next speaker. Eve Andre Lerme is an incredibly accomplished um, and compelling artist whose work has a, a real multifaceted depth. She uses often a deliberate subversion of fact and fiction, myth and reality that challenges belief systems. Her work merges with ideas in science and nature, ideas that are about subjectivity and poetry. All at once, her work can be visual, conceptual, cultural, social, literary narrative, and or performative. She's an artist whose complex and engaging work is, is uh, most often done as sculpture and installation. She also does drawings and performance work. And she's visiting us from her home in Brooklyn, New York. Her work has been exhibited extensively throughout the universe, um, through, <laughs> through the universe, through through the U.S. and the world, and in over 12 different countries, including the Czech Republic, uh, Germany, Israel, England, Poland, Russia, France, Brazil, Spain, Italy, and the Netherlands. She's been a recipient of either fellowships, grants, or awards from the following prestigious organizations, uh, which include the National Endowment for the Arts, the Paula Krasner Foundation, the Guggenheim Museum, the Warhol Foundation, and the New York Foundation for the Arts. She's taught sculpture installation and critical theory at Cooper Union for the Advancement of Arts and Science, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Rhode Island School of Art and Design, Sarah Lawrence College, New York University, and Fairfield University. She is now the chair of the Department of Interdisciplinary Sculpture at the Maryland Institute College of Art. She's currently working on an installation and book about her 
about the transformation of the Salton Sea and Mojave Desert during the Cold War. Her visual score on gravity anomalies will be performed this year by ensembles in Shanghai, China, and Hamburg, Germany. Before I bring her up, I want to thank a, a few of the funding and supportive organizations that have helped bring um, Eve to ISU. Um, the Center for the Excellence in the Arts and the Humanities, um, the College of Design, the College of Agriculture, um, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Department of Art and Design, the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology, and Environmental Studies. The title of her lecture is Art Meets Science in the 21st Century. Please help me welcome Eve Andre Laramie. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Greg Fuqua for his wonderful hosting of me. Uh, to tell you something about the kind of person Greg is, is uh, after my first night here, he said, how'd you sleep? I said, well, those bells keep going off every 15 minutes. He went out and bought me earplugs. Is that great? Um, so I'd like to thank Greg. I'd like to thank uh, Dennis Dake and the Center for Excellence in Arts and Humanities here at Iowa State. And I'm very grateful that over, my over the years, my work has allowed me to travel, uh, both nationally and internationally. And uh, could we get the slide projector uh, light turned on? But we don't have to advance to the first one. Let me tell you something about my artistic pr process. I start with a hunch or sometimes a swoon. And momentum starts building, and I know I'm on to something, but I don't quite understand it yet. So I start paying attention to things differently and more acutely, looking for patterns, similarities, resonances. There is an increase in time spent reading, researching, listening, talking, an increase in general activity, but still not knowing exactly what the outcome of all of this might be. Then threads start twisting themselves into crisp lines of flight, and nodes start erupting on the threads, and something begins to emerge, which is more like a faint melody than anything formed, like hearing someone whistle in the dark without seeing the source of the sound. Then comes the time of information gathering, collecting data, it starts to flow in from all directions and the glorious abundance is intoxicating. This is where others come in. This is the network. This is the collective brain of art and science. When your work and the works of others start building into an architecture, nebulous at first, but a structure begins to develop out of the ooze. Then a phase shift happens and suddenly all the patterns snap into place a glittering, crystalline configuration. And then I have the beginnings of a piece. And from that point forward, it's simply a matter of logistics, practicalities, and being organized. Before I begin to show you slides, I'd like to give you some background information on my personal history so that you have some context for my thoughts. I was born and raised in Los Angeles and the geography exposed me to vast and dramatic natural phenomena, such as earthquakes, floods, fires, mudslides, debris flows. These natural phenomena of extraordinary scale and magnitude put into perspective for me the smallness of the constructed urban social landscape of the city by comparison, giving me an awareness of the issues of microcosm and macrocosm. This drove me to investigate issues of the com complex relationship between nature and culture later on. Secondly, growing up in a family in which science was practiced and valued, my father was an electrical engineer who immigrated from Montreal to Southern California to work in the aerospace industry during the Cold War. My older brother is a chemist in the area of mass spectrometry. For over 20 years, my work has investigated ways in which science gazes at nature and humankind 
and how those speculations differ from the ways in which artists relate to these phenomena. My passion for the history of science and an interest in how cultures construct knowledge has driven me to question the alleged neutrality and objectivity of science. The culture of science compels me to look into how we develop our belief systems, our values, and how we as cultures determine what truth is, how we determine the varieties, grounds, and validity of knowledge, and how these epistemological uncertainties cross-reference with art. I am interested in investigating the role that imagination, ambiguity, and metaphor play in these practices. This approach to art and science is reflected in the work of some of my contemporaries, such as Matthew Ritchie, who you see here, um, who uh, is a painter influenced by Big Bang Theory, and he also has created these fictional characters that sort of play into the origin and evolution of the universe. Louis de Soto, uh, who deals with the intersection of his Native American roots with uh, different theories of cosmology and with technology. Janine Antoni, uh, whose work here deals with um, weaving her brain waves. She, was she would sleep in this bed and she was connected to one of those EEG e e machines, is that the one that is your brain waves? And then during the day, she would wave, or, um, weave the patterns of her brain waves into the blanket that she slept on uh, in, at night. Really amazing work. Tim Hawkinson, whose uber organ piece here, he's kind of a, a quintessential uh, boy science geek type. And uh, David Wilson and the uh, Museum of Jurassic Technology, who has a fictional take on the notion of science and natural history. And this is a model, supposedly, of the real Noah's Ark. And uh, Erica Wanamaker, whose current work deals with the human radiation experiments that were done during the Cold War. And this is her work. Um, Getting on to my own work, um, this was a project at uh, MIT in the List Visual Arts Center. And um, the inspiration for this was the Jacquard loom, a machine invented in 1801 by Joseph Marie Jacquard, which operated on a binary system of punched cards upon which the fabric it wove was encoded. These punch cards are identical in function to those employed until the mid 20th century in computational devices. I'll just go back to this. Um, the installation explores these and other resonances between the prehistory of the computer, going back more than 200 years, and modern era digital technology. My intention was to emphasize the fact that digital technology and the computer, considered to be most a feature of contemporary culture, is actually part of a centuries-old history, intricately linked to the decorative arts by way of the jacquard loom, the performing arts by way of mechanical musical instruments, and entertainment devices by way of automaton figures. I want to reconsider the forgotten materiality of the word digital by retrieving the etymology of that word and its relationship to the hand and handwork. In doing so, I wish to make manifest an invisible web or network of communication and transmission of information embedded in the panorama of history. The installation took the form of a Rococo period room. I decided to situ situate the flowering of these technologies during the reign of terror in France. So instead of creating an installation with the appearance of a 21st century cyber salon, I chose to transform the white box gallery into a late 18th century drawing room, such as might have existed in Jacquard's time. I designed a pictorial brocade fabric 
woven on a contemporary computerized jacquard loom, illustrating my interpretation of key events and players. This image is a portrait, you can see him in the middle there, is a portrait of Joseph Marie Jacquard, woven in the 19th century at 1,200 threads per inch. So, th so this image is about this big. Um, it has an almost photographic quality, making the loom analogous to a computer printer. Jacquard was influenced by the mechanical automata of Jacques de Vaucanson, who invented a mechanical automaton duck, which could quack, flap its wings, eat corn, and supposedly defecate. <laughs> Valkinson was influenced by the technology of mechanical musical instruments, such as those using pin cylinders and punched metal discs. And sadly, he died destitute when it was discovered that it was a hoax that the duck actually defecated. It had a separate mechanism in the rear end than it had in the front end. I'm not kidding, that's true. Interestingly, Jacquard was placed under state arrest in 1799 by Napoleon to expedite the development of the punch card driven automated loom to more efficiently weave textiles for military applications, uniforms, sails, and tents for the Grand Army. In 1801, the loom was unveiled at the Paris Expo. Ten years later, the Luddite riots occurred in England in which textile workers smashed the automated steam-driven looms at, that were causing their unemployment. These events resonate on multiple levels of politics, culture, and economy of the early 19th century Europe. For example, the organization of labor, modern industrial automation, and on another level, the impact of industrial-produced textiles on the, the domestic interior uh, in new and opulent forms of draperies and upholstery. So you see the interiors of people's homes changing at this time too, where there are all these big padded chairs and huge draperies. So this, in my opinion, was psychologically padding the occupants from uh, in their, these interior spaces from the terror without, because again, this was the reign of terror in France when this was taking place. Uh, one of the images that are woven, that's woven into the fabric is this prosthetic hand designed by Perret in 1564. I see this as part of the lineage of the connection between humans and machines, leading up to current work being done in robotics, haptics, even virtual reality and prosthetic devices. The portrait of the woman that's in the fabric, and I don't, we might be able to see her if we go back a little bit. Um, let's see, can you, you might be able to make her out there. Uh, the portrait of the woman is the Countess Ada Byron Lovelace, a leading mathematician in the mid 19th century credited with being the first computer programmer as she conceived of and wrote the programs for Charles Babbage's analog computers or calculating devices, the difference engine and the analytical engine. We're just gonna go forward one more time here. And uh, in the fabric, there's a background grid and that background grid is taken from the pattern of wires used in the magnetic memory cores of the Whirlwind computer, which was invented at MIT in 1949. This type of memory used woven copper wires, and that's what you're looking at here, strung with small magnets to store information. I had the good fortune while working on this project to meet Jay Forrester, the MIT-based computer scientist who invented woven core memory. And he told me a story of collaborating with an industrial ceramicist in New Jersey who made the mixture that the tiny ring-shaped magnets um, were uh, actually made out of. He said that this craftsman's touch was so sensitive that he could literally put his hand into a bucket of the powdered mix and tell if it would magnetize correctly. Now, I don't know if that's true, but if not, it's a beautiful story about um, a collaboration between an artist and a scientist. It's also a perfect example of the intelligence of the body. 
and this is one of these magnetic memory cores, and there'd be literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of these that were um, uh, in a huge array. The, the memory for the whirlwind computer took up a building that was 3,500 square feet. It was simply like 12K of memory space. Um, um, and lastly, ants and spiders, that, uh, those images are also woven into this fabric. Uh, the spider is a reference to the idea of weaving, hearkening back to the arachne myth, and looking forward to the world wide web. Interestingly, textiles made on automated looms in the 19th century were sometimes referred to as spider work, which was a derogatory term, uh, meaning that this um, machine-made textile was less fine than that made by hand. In the MIT archive, I found this wonderful image of an ant with the tiny little magnets from the memory cores, and the ant supposedly is in there for scale. Uh, and so in the fabric, images of ants are woven into the fabric, for me as a reference to artificial intelligence, as some of the current models for AI come from biology, specifically that of social insects. The field intelligence of insect colonies and the way in which they think en masse is an alternative model to the big brain or human model for intelligence. And finally, I'd like to say that with this work, it was the historian of science, Evelyn Fox Keller, who generously advocated for me to do this installation at MIT and to position this work specifically there, and she um, consulted with me throughout. So although she wasn't a creative collaborator, she was a, a different type of um, collaborator in that she was a facilitator. Instrument to communicate with Kepler's ghost was cited both inside and outside the High Museum in Atlanta. The historical source for the work was Johannes Kepler's treatise from the 17th century, Harmonicus Mundi, which describes the alleged harmonic nature of the universe and the planetary motions as having a musical relation, a beautiful but incorrect theory. Interestingly, it is believed that Kepler falsified his observational data to prove his theory, which raises questions regarding subjectivity in science and whether he was making science or making art. Perhaps he was writing fiction. Astronomical diagrams from Harmonicus Mundi were transferred in copper onto the piano-shaped skylight. Wires from these copper diagrams enter the museum through a small window and lead to a device on the top floor of the gallery, a copper keyboard marked with the letters of the alphabet. I was fortunate that there were the same number of windows in the um, skylight as there are letters in the alphabet. That was just one of these weird coincidences. So it's, I assigned each of those windows a letter to the alphabet, and each of those wires then connected to the key on the keyboard. Using simple telegraph technology, visitors to the museum could depress keys to allegedly send messages to Kepler's ghost via the large skylight antenna. Although it is impossible and perhaps absurd to send a message to the ghost of a dead astronomer, because the device had the appearance of an anti antiquated scientific apparatus with a logical seeming system of operation, some audience members believed the device actually worked. This calls into question our cultural biases towards the authority of science and technology and ultimately how we construct knowledge and truth. Apparatus for the distillation of vague intuitions is an installation of variable dimension and configuration consisting of an array of dysfunctional anachronistic scientific apparatus. Utilizing alchemical engravings from the 16th century as a visual source, Several hundred hand-blown glass vessels are engraved with text elements referring to subjectivity, intuition, guesswork, and desire. And in this uh, slide, you can uh, see that this um, gravity feed vessel has been calibrated not to cubic um, centiliters, but to different degrees of mistakes. Uh, can, can you read that from there? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> Although it appears like a vast laboratory, it simultaneously disputes the notion of pure objectivity in science. Aesthetically driven, this sprawl of apparatus is like a map of the conscious mind. It, question, it asks questions for which there are no logical answers. As so-called rational beings, we tend to believe that science is the method through which provable, testable, objective truths can be understood. Through scientific observation, the mysteries of life can be decoded through knowledge, the mastery of nature is supposedly accomplished. In this sense, nature becomes nature with a capital N. When we assimilate it into our belief system, when we discover it, name it, measure it, classify it, control it, and alter it. Thus, when we possess nature by giving it a name, we assign meaning and value to nature. In Western culture, we tend to relegate subjective experience to art and truth to science, but both are processes of discovery through which the individual constructs meaning and knowledge. And these two uh, vessels, the top one says polysemy and the lower one says misconception, and it's sort of squirting into um, that. And then this one is matter of chance. There were three, matter of chance, leap in the dark, and hazard of the die. Uh, knowing the mechanics of how nature works cannot tell us what it truly is, but rather what we want to know about it, or sometimes what the funders of scientific research desire to know about it. The boundary between sense and nonsense is a slippery one and has to do with the position of the observer. My desire with this work is not to make pat judgments about the scientific establishment, but rather to bring to the fore the infinitely recombinant character of experimentation and process common to artists and scientists alike. <coughs> when exhibited, apparat <coughs> apparatus is paired with a small companion work as reserved as apparatus is theatrical. Titled Salt of Sweat, it is a concave disc 18 inches across with brownish crystals at the center, the actual salt of my sweat, commingled with my glass blower's sweat, and I may say handsome muscular glass blowers. <laughs> During these, this three-month residency that I did at Urban Glass, when most of the glass for apparatus was blown, I was moved by the process of working with fabricators, which I had never done before. I had always worked alone in the studio. Using the rag that's pictured in the slide to wipe the sweat from our brows for three months, I then boiled the rag in water, evaporated the fluid to retrieve the salty residue of the sweat of our labors. The salt is evidence of the physical intelligence we brought to bear on the molten glass shaping it with our hands and breath. This bodily intelligence is necessarily subjective and seated in each individual. It is factual. It's rooted in the facts of the body and the breath, the techniques and techniques of the body. Thus, through our labors, the glassmakers echoed my own critique of science, the inescapable subjectivity in every human pursuit whether mental or physical. The relationship between seawater and human blood forms the conceptual foundation for cellular memory. These two watery mediums are similar not only in chemical makeup, but in physiological function, serving as sources of life. Even more significant is the idea that these teeming aqueous substances also share metaphorical meaning. The rhythm of the tides can be equated to the circulation of blood as saline fluid pulses through two thir over two-thirds of the globe and throughout the human body. And while human beings are creatures evolved from the sea, the human body contains the ocean in its blood. Over a mile of vinyl tubing filled with red wine cascade across the floor of the gallery on a modulating surface of crystallized sea salt. The scale of the work is both micro and macrocosmic, 
denoting the insides of the body as well as a room-sized landscape. There is an ambient sound component, mixing the beat of the human heart with the sound of ocean waves, creating a primal, unrecognizable rhythm. And oh, I me uh, failed to mention that, oops, uh, I think something's stuck. Okay, we'll just move on then. Um, I was uh, just going to mention that um, the glass vessels that contained the red wine were each engraved with a very small element of text, just poetic fragments so that as you walk through the piece, it was almost like walking through not only a body or walking through a landscape, but walking through a poem. The eroded terrain of memory installed at Wesleyan University in Connecticut consists of two parts, a 53-foot-long fault line and a 21-foot-long mica landscape, landslide. The work addresses issues of geological memory and the blurring of boundaries. The piece referred to the local geology, specifically to a geological fault on the east coast of the United States. Rocks on one side of the fault are 200 million years older than rocks on the other side of the fault. The older rock is believed by geologists as per plate tectonic theory to be a fragment of the African continent as the stones match those in Morocco. This raises the strange question as to whether Connecticut, Yankee Doodle Dandy, is in fact Africa and vice versa. <laughs> I collaborated with a geologist, Yelly DeBoer, and a cartographer geologist, Sidney Quarrier, and I always thought that that was interesting, his na last name was Quarrier, and he was a geologist. Um, and there's a, a, a similar um, collaborator comes up later on, which I'll talk to you about, that also had this funny linguistic thing happening with his name and his profession. Um, the work, a Smithson-like site non-site, was made from metamorphic rock, mica, quartz, and feldspar gathered from mines and quarries along the fault line. I placed one ton of this rock on suspended glass panels in the main gallery space. The eroded terrain of memory draws attention to the arbitrariness of boundaries as rock is shared by all the continents. It questions cultural attitudes towards land, such as ownership of property, mineral rights, and international borders. In the North Gallery, I constructed an inclined plane of wood which was covered with one and a half tons of mica, a reflective stone. And there's a circular skylight in this um, uh, room, beautiful limestone walls and a sc circular sky skylight. During the course of the day, light from the skylight passed over the surface of the mica, creating an ever-changing light patterns on the walls of the space. It's about 2.30 in the afternoon, it's about 4 o'clock. Uh, the piece became a kind of axis mundi, a still place on which uh, the turning earth creed, you know, just a still place that sort of made you aware of the fact that the earth is moving because you could trace this light um, moving. So it's a kind of index for observing the passage of time. Parks on Trucks, project for the city of Aachen, uh, was a collaboration with the biogeographer Duane Griffin, who's based at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. It consists of a series of parks on a fleet of uh, three large commercial Mercedes-Benz flatbed trucks that circulated through the city of Aachen, Germany, and were parked in different places on a weekly basis. The project highlights the complex and contradictory relationships between nature and culture in a way that delights the mind and the eye while provoking serious consideration of place, landscape, and the role of historical, aesthetic, and geographic contingency in the natural world and the meanings that we attribute to it. It was the 19th century landscape painter Asher B. Durand who first proposed the national parks. Later, the spectacular paintings of Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Moran were brought into congressional hearings 
to lobby for the development of the national parks and as visual propaganda to fuel the westward expansion. Parks represent some of the most natural elements in our landscapes, and yet they are designed and cultivated, controlled and aestheticized using methods that are clearly unnatural and sometimes extremely so. Parks are particularly interesting because we tend to see them as sacred spaces, luxurious romanticizations and fetishizations of nature that are only possible because modern industrial economies buffer us from the worst of nature's hazards and discomforts. This security and comfort, however, frequently imposes high environmental costs that make it necessary to, na to rescue nature from culture by designing and producing parks. Uh, and this quotation is taken from the physicist um, Richard Feynman. Reality must take precedence over public relations for nature cannot be fooled. There is something that is simultaneously humorous, sardonic, radical, and reverential about this gesture. The hybridization of these apparent opposites foregrounds the interconnectedness of things and begins to dissolve the comfortable autonomy we try to impose on nature and culture, art and science. This is not, however, an effort to reconcile opposites. Rather, we used art and science to deploy nature, plants, soil, water, biochemical processes, and culture, topiary forms, sculpture, agricultural crops, history, mediated and transported by political economy, trucks, road networks, commerce, to blur boundaries, to engage in discourses, and to reconfigure boundaries. A 10 meter long truck was planted with a topiary garden as a reference to artificial nature. Another, plant was, uh, another truck was planted with medicinal and poisonous plants, plants that had both properties. The third truck, planted with a small crop of corn, pollutes the environment and cleans the air at the same rate. <laughs> by equating carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere by the corn plants growing on the back of the truck with the amount of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere as exhaust, as the truck moves from location to location around the city. Dr. Griffin monitored the growth of the plants, calculated the distance the truck was driven in order to balance the carbon dioxide inputs and outputs. So over a three month period, that truck was only, we only allowed it to be driven a third of a kilometer in three months. <laughs> This truck focused attention on the nature of biogeochemical cycles, issues related to global warming and the complexity of human impacts on the environment. The project also raised issues about corporate greenwashing, where companies such as Mercedes-Benz, the manufacturer of these trucks, use nature images in their advertising strategies. And Mercedes-Benz was great to work with. They knew exactly what we were up to. And they knew that we were sort of, you know, um, poking our fingers at them a little bit. And they were great. They were willing to sort of look at, look at the fact that their, you know, annual report was filled with all of these nature images. And um, it, was, it was quite remarkable. Uh, oops, sorry, that's been backwards. That's the corn. Sugar mud. How does one make a work of art about the Hudson River after so many interpretations by artists over the past two centuries have been made? I almost turned down this commission from Wave Hill, a center for art and horticulture in the Bronx, because of this redundancy. In seeking another point of view on the subject, I began looking at the river upside down and sideways through scientific imaging of the benthos or the bottom of the river. Sugar mud features a room-sized mound of crystallized sugar tinted an opulent shade of golden yellow. This jewel-like sugar dune deliriously slopes 
halfway to the ceiling, sweeping over two windowsills and into the fireplace in an elegant room of the gallery in a former mansion overlooking the Hudson River. An unearthly golden light spills through the windows. The result of theater gels covering the glass enhances the super-saturated saccharine sweet golden glow furthering the room's evocation of New York's gilded age. But there is something perverse about this spectacular, subversive collision of architecture and a seemingly geological formation of this dazzling mass of sugar, which appears to have surged into the gallery with the force of an earthquake. Presented with the sugar mound are five documentary images, you see three here, one of which is a photograph of the 150-year-old American Sugar Refining Company's factory on the Hudson in Yonkers, and that's what this photograph is on um, your right. Um, and the uh, sugar factory is just north of the gallery uh, in Yonkers. A superimposed text explains that 80,000 tons of sediment from the river bottom in front of the factory were dredged by the Army Corps of Engineers and dumped downstream at the historic area remediation site near Sandy Hook, New Jersey, an area also known as the mud dump site. And what happened was over the years, you know, all this sludge was being dumped into the, um, the river. It, it mixed with sediments and silt and clay that were coming downstream. And there was a point where the boats couldn't dock in front of the factory anymore, which is why the factory had that area dredged. I was struck by the irony of the government's terminology for the reburial of the sugar mud remediation, since the sludge, however sweet, is toxic. It contains an array of toxins, including PCBs that flow downstream from the General Electric plant over the years. And when you dredge like that, you're also, um, uh, you know, you're stirring up all the sediment, but you're also just you know, disturbing habitat. Other, in, um, other images include two benthic maps, and this is one of them. And what you see on the left there, that depression is actually the dredge canal. So I had two benthic maps of the Hudson's floor. Uh, I it collaborated with two environmental scientists from SUNY Stony Brook, a marine geologist, Roger Flood. Again, we have this funny thing. <laughs> Sydney Quarrier and Roger Flood. Um, and Vicki Lynn Farini, a doctoral student. Invited on board their research vessel, the Seawolf, I observed them mapping the Yonkers area of the river using sonar and ground penetrating radar scans. The readings and digital analyses produced these vivid, um, sort of pseudo topographic maps depicting the river bottom from underneath, re envisioned not only spatially, but in terms of color, and the color represents both the floor of the river's depth and its density. I was particularly fascinated with the many subjective decisions that were being made by Dr. Flood as the data was streaming in uh, to this onboard laboratory. Map making, like other forms of science, involves a little bit of guesswork. Also presented were reproductions of a pair of paintings depicting the river from the proximity of Yonkers. One from 1850 is an idyllic Hudson River School landscape by John Bunyan Bristol. Buttery yellow uh, sunlight emerges from misty, misty clouds and bathes the water in its golden glow. That's the one on the left. It uh, was this admittedly saccharine feature that most appeal appealed to me, along with the dune-like palisade on the Jersey uh, sure. The second painting from 1915 by the equally obscure modernist painter Daniel Putnam Brineley is of the sugar factory at Yonkers, so that blue painting, I'm sorry it's skewed, but it's the actual sugar factory uh, done in 1915. Uh, his rendering celebrates the bustle of industry and again suggests how picture making supports ideology which in turn changes the very nature of the landscape it depicts. And uh, 
Greg, if you could please change uh, the carousel. I'm going to brief, uh, well, maybe not so briefly. I hope I don't end up going too much over my t allotted time. But there are two works that, I, that are in progress right now. Um, fluid Geographies is one of them. The other one is called Secret History um, Nether Zone. And um, I wanted to talk with you about them. Generally, it, it, my working process, I love doing research, um, and my working process, anywhere between two and five years in developing a piece. Um, fluid Geographies is a work currently in progress that investigates the environmental legacy of the invention of the atomic bomb and Cold War R&D in northern New Mexico. High atop the Pajarito Plateau, nestled within its many canyons, lies Los Alamos National Laboratories. That's what you see, those little buildings up there on top of the, um, uh, the hills, uh, 19 miles from Santa Fe as the crow flies. During the Manhattan Project in the following Cold War years, approximately 17 million cubic feet of radioactive and other toxic wastes were buried in the ground and in the arroyos surrounding the labs, in containers ranging from cardboard boxes to steel drums. In 2001, the Cerro Grande fires, and some of you may remember hearing about those fires were part of the labs actually burned. Um, the fires denuded the land, uh, and uh, so the erosion patterns shifted and changed. And those arroyos that were pretty much dry for years, now water was rushing down them because there wasn't the ground cover. By August 2002, elevated levels of tritium, a um, radioactive isotope of hydrogen, was detected in the drinking water, the groundwater, and in the deep aquifer water in Los Alamos. The labs confirmed this fact in the press and stated that the tritium is a byproduct of the lab's weapons-related activities. The um, indigenous peoples Cochiti Pueblo and San, Ilfon San Ildelfonso Pueblo lands lie directly downstream. This is um, the remains of the Cerro Grande fire. Um, <coughs> So the indigenous people's lands um, lie directly downstream from the Pajarito Plateau upon which the labs are situated, as do the Buckman Wells, which supply water to the city of Santa Fe. And you can see all these arroyos drain down into the Rio Grande, and the Rio Grande flows down that a body of water that you see at the lower part of this map is the Cochiti Dam. Tritium, uh, Tritium emits beta particles that do not penetrate the dead outer layer of the skin. However, tritium is an internal hazard, not an external one. Tritium tends to move like water. When ingested, the blood distributes tritated water throughout all of the bodily fluids, as though it were normal water. The majority of one's body weight is made up of soft tissues, all of which can be irradiated by the decaying tritium. So one could extrapolate that the result of any tritium ingestion results in a whole body equivalent dose. Following the disclosure in the year 2000 that strontium-90 was detected in northern New Mexico water, the recent discovery of tritium seep seepage is of deep concern to the local communities. The rate of brain and nervous system and thyroid cancers is considerably higher in this region than in other state and national reference populations. I have begun developing this into an art installation, uh, mapping conflicting information from the various agencies studying the water issues. And I did a two week long summer workshop at the Santa Fe Art Institute in which I worked with a group of students and the assistance of two hydrologists uh, from Los Alamos National Labs, Dr. Elizabeth Keating and Dr. Velimir Velesinov, uh, as well as an independent environmental scientist, Greg Mello. The students and I then created a temporary public art installation at Cochiti Dam 
a massive Army Corps of Engineers dam on the Rio Grande, located directly downstream from the labs on the Cote de Pueblo Indian lands. Uh, and what we did was um, we, you know, took a trip to the dam, and it, there's one of those, like, tourist turnouts, you know, where you can park your car. And there was a place where there used to be a plaque where you could read this plaque, look out over the dam, and it probably said, you know, this is the Cochiti Dam, blah, blah, blah. And what we did is we made an insert for that. So instead of it, it describing Cochiti Dam, what we did is we made our, not the periodic table of elements, but the periodic table of the <laughs> elements of all of the known hazards that were buried at Los Alamos uh, National Lab. So we inserted that into um, this thing that was there. So this artistic intervention approached the subject of environmental issues with aesthetics, dark humor, and hopefully some political relevance. And I'm still working on it. And I think what I'm going to do, I'm doing a lot of the Photoshop things. And I think I want to have them woven into rugs, um, you know, parts of this information because of the history of weaving in uh, northern New Mexico. And then on to another um, work in progress. Um, Nether Zone, the fourth chapter of my secret history project, explores the spatial qualities and socio-historical atmosphere of Southern California during the Cold War through a cast of fictional characters who make this landscape their theater of operations. Landscapes are accumulations of social behaviors and cultural values which impact upon places over time. Fictional landscapes which erupt out of real ones, throw history into question. They are a composite of environmental indicators, behaviors, in innuendos, technologies, and rumors. They are comprised of the confluences and assemblages of material, spatial, semiotic, poetic, political, historical, and aesthetic realms. They are mixed up, uplifted, subinducted, as the San Andreas Fault Zone, the complex system of geological faults which accounts for the earthquakes and geothermal phenomenon in California. In 1997, I began Secret History with the creation of an alter ego, Eve Fisio, Eve as in Eve Klein, the male YVES. Eve Fisio was an electrical engineer and secret artist who worked from 1949 to 1962 in the aerospace industry in Southern California. For six months, I became Eve Fisio, invented his personal history, and made his artwork rather than my work. I succeeded in thinking like another person, not by, by not breaking character. Every time I went to my studio, I thought, okay, I'm not going to think like myself. I'm going to think like this other person. And I allowed Fisio to be real in the world in that sense. I exhibited the results of this experiment in two installations, and I also gave a number of lecture performances in which I introduced my alter ego as a real person. I adopted a genre associated with historical museum exhibition displays, and I became the curator of the exhibition, as well as the executrix of Fisio's estate. The installation presented over 200 works I made as Fisio, arranged chronologically alongside wall text, which contextualized the objects. This strategy perplexed the museum director, who was concerned that they would lose their audience by presenting an unknown mid-century artist. <laughs> the museum wanted to show Eve's work, not Eve's. <laughs> but, I, but it wasn't until I outed my alter ego at the 2002 CAA conference panel, Free Radicals, Visionary Artists, Maverick Educators, that the public knew that Fisio and the entire Secret History Project was a hybrid form of fact and fiction. And this is one of his drawings in which he, one of the things he believed in was hollow earth theory. And um, that, you know, the earth is a sphere and that there's the North Hole and the South Hole, <laughs> rather than the North Pole and the South Pole. And that, you know, we all know that the earth is a sphere and it's covered with salt water. And he had this theory that that's very similar to the eye and he related it to optics. 
and the earth too is a sphere covered with salt water and it also has a hole in one end which is the pupil where light rays enter and then at the back of the eye is where the optic nerve exits so it was so much fun to concoct these wonderful theories sort of harebrained but really great really great um, fun in the studio Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, discompatible um, varnishes <laughs> work really good. <laughs> Mixing water-based things with oil-based things works really good. Everything you're not supposed to do works. <laughs> The installation presented uh, over, uh, oh wait, sorry, I've lost my place here. Um, in the following years, I have developed 11 additional characters. And I now realize that I, that I am not only working towards creating a new kind of installation, but, I, but that I'm also writing a novel, but I'm doing it through visual art. VCO is based in part on a character from a Thomas Pynchon novel, The Crying of Lot 49, and in part my father, Yves Andre Ficio Diet Laramé, who I was obviously named after. My parents separated when I was only three and a half years old, and the last time I saw my father, I was about five. He was an electrical engineer in the aerospace industry, and he was also a metalsmith and a draftsman and an amateur photographer. And throughout my adult life, I searched to find him. I wanted to find my father. And so there's a serious element to this work. Um, I finally did find him as a death record on the internet. I found his death certificate. In 1995, I inherited seven notebooks belonging to my father, which when my mother died in 95, she left me this set of these seven notebooks. And in the installation you saw there, there were these suitcases piled in front. There were seven suitcases, and that was the um, analogy to these notebooks. I remember seeing these notebooks as a child, and my mother used to refer to them as daddy's scientific notebooks. Uh, upon studying them as an adult, I realized that my father's interests were complex as the notebooks were filled with writings and diagrams having to do not only with science, but with alchemy, theosophy, Rosicrucianism, and hollow earth theory. So he was a complex character. I had a lot of material to work with. Uh, through this discovery, I realized that I would never have a chance to meet him and to know him. So I decided I would invent him as an artwork. Pynchon himself figured into Ficio's constructed bio biography. This is actually one of my father's um, drawings from the notebooks on um, hollow earth theory. He, for uh, apparently a number of years in his life, believed in um, uh, the hollow earth theory that was put forward by a guy named Cyrus Reed Teed, who um, had a utopian community in near uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And that branch of hollow earth theory is um, called Korshanity. Um, so pretty weird stuff. Um, so lots of pseudoscience. Uh, Pynchon himself figured into constructed by um, Ficio's constructed biography as this artist scientist's closest friend and colleague at Boeing Aircraft, where Pynchon was actually employed as a technical writer in the early 1960s before achieving fame. And here's where you know fact and fiction really start to blur. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Pynchon, you know he's a recluse. There's only like two known photographs of Thomas Pynchon. However, in the Eficio archives, there are numerous photographs <laughs> of Thomas Pynchon. And here you see him uh, as a young man in 1963 on Manhattan Beach, uh, California. And um, interestingly, Pynchon really was um, employed by Boeing in the 60s um, as a tech writer. Um, and then he uh, got famous and didn't have to do that anymore. The character of Ficio 
held straight. Oh, and I should just say, this is um, uh, on the left is infrared uh, photograph of Thomas Pynchon made by EFCO, and on the right is a gamma ray photograph of, uh, of Thomas Pynchon. The uh, character of Fisio held straight jobs as an engineer while maintaining a parallel existence as an artist, which he held as a closely guarded secret, fearful of how his activities might be judged by his conservative employers. Over time, Fisio's secret life and his interests became known to his employer, and he was fired as a security risk in the early 1960s for his leftist leaning. That he moved in uh, communist circles was a suspicion fed by his Hollywood starlet wife, Mia Lamar, <laughs> who starred in B-grade science fiction films. <laughs> such as, it came from an alternative state. <laughs> um, Mia Lamar had been blacklisted by entertainment industry reactionaries during McCarthyism. Fisio uh, persisted in his artistic practice nevertheless after going into exile in Mexico with his wife and Thomas Pynchon on behalf of Theodore Adorno's generous financial assistance. This project calls into question whether art can be fictive and authentic at the same time. My intention with Secret History was not to create a hoax, but rather to discover something about who I imagined my father to be. I also wanted to see if I could make art by using my mind differently, by dropping the usual ego boundaries around my own work to see if this would unveil hidden aspects of identity to see if perhaps this process would reveal a little bit of him in me. But fiction and history are beyond my search to understand my father. The work is about how we know what we know. It is a rethinking of the notion of truth. And this is a Glenn Baxter cartoon. The telling and retelling of a story creates its own mythology. Secret history examines personal enduring things such as self-knowledge, and on another level, it is a critique of the Cold War paranoia that existed during that time. It's an analysis of the California dream. It's a psychological inquest and an environmental expose. What was at first destabilizing and scary became like a game, became like detective work. There was a point where I was kind of scared I was going to slip into, you know, schizophrenia from doing this project. But it became like detective work. But who was I investigating? A real person or an imaginary construct? Was I detecting my own desires of who I wanted my father to be? Was I making a game out of turning a loss, the loss of my father, into a game? The most uncanny result of this experimental artwork was my discovery of an entire branch of the Laramie family that I didn't know existed previously. I discovered I have a half-sister who is 17 and a half years older, nieces and nephews, great nieces, great nephews. By creating fiction, I uncovered the truth. And at this point, everything that I thought I knew about art just collapsed. It just crumbled into dust. And uh, all of those things like having shows and galleries and museums and selling your work and all of that just stopped being important to me uh, once I found my sister. I mean, it was just such a remarkable thing. This crazy artwork kind of led me to my family. Like all histories and memories, the history of the self is always orchestrated out of fragments of information, both factional and fictional, into a conceptual matrix which represents truth or reality. Secret history is not finished yet. In fact, it may be an endless work, an infinite game, another unfinished story, one worth telling again and again because it is driven by necessity and the desire to know. And that which we can never, ever know, as artists, we can create. We have the freedom to make it up as we go. 
Chapter 4 of this ongoing project maps the mind onto the land and the land onto the mind. For me, the nether zone is a geographical region and a psychological space that cannot be captured, cannot be fully comprehended through representation or conceptualization. It must also be lived. It must be experienced somatically, perceptually, and temporally. In this nether zone, the following cast of characters play out their lives. Their story begins in Los Angeles, they migrate to the Mojave Desert, then they travel lower into the Sonoran Desert to the Salton Sea, where they live for a year before heading into Mexico. My project retraces their steps 50 years later, finding clues of their presence as well as a landscape on the verge of environmental collapse. Now, I've already mentioned the first three characters, that being Eve, Mia, and Thomas. And uh, then we have Dr. Dwayne Phoenix of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Uh, oh, actually, that's also Thomas Pynchon. Um, there's Dwayne Phoenix, um, a hydrological engineer, amateur pyrotechnician, <laughs> specialist in natural and unnatural disasters. There's also Dr. Professor Octavio Ruiz de Leon, who is an entomologist and an etymologist researching the relationship between language and cryptography on the one hand and insect communication and behavior on the other. There's Dr. Leanne Maver, cultural anthropologist and executive director of the Center for Parascientific Research. Arthur Black, an art historian writing the catalog raisonné of Fisio's obscure artwork that fell through the cracks of history and uh, Dr. J.D. Lickdicker of Bakersfield, California, ARPANET project director and RAND Corporation consultant, an unnamed doppelganger character, part biological and chemical weapons specialist working for the military, and the other part a retired mechanic who worked at Lockheed Market Martin's Skunk Works at uh, Plant 42 in Palmdale, California who is currently managing an illegal methamphetamine lab in the Panamint Mountains, west of Death Valley. Then there's Maria Edipa, a drifter living on the psychological periphery, a constellation of bad luck and bad choices. And a Spiritu Blavatsky, clairvoyant seismologist, able to predict earthquakes at 90% accuracy, who communicates with the ghosts of Werner Von Braun and Ernie Kovacs. <laughs> Driving east from Los Angeles, one sees the desert consumed by earth-moving machines and accreted into a matrix of exclusive or exclusionary gated communities on the other side of the line of bulldozers and agricultural workers or military installations on the other. An assembly of post-metropolitic splendor and loss. While the Mojave Desert slumbers, fleets are trained, tactics developed, new and traditional weapon systems are tested in laboratories and deployed in major exercises conducted on numerous combat, bombing, and tactical training ranges in the finest weather in the world for testing weapons. The sweeping expanses of the Southern California Desert provides a spatial framework to support the highest standards in warfare through supremacy in technology. This is a Barbara Kruger piece. There are five million acres of military installations in the Southern California desert, providing the warfighter with absolute combat power through technologies that deliver dominant combat effects and matchless capabilities in realistic environments. This is um, John Tingley's piece from the 1960s where he built this sculpture out at the Nevada test site and then he blew it up. Um, a desert is defined by the relationship of water to land. The word desert conjures up expansive and sublime horizontalities, notions of innovative lifestyles, and monolithic earthworks. The desert is a value judgment as much as a locality that connotes emptiness, which is associated with particular spatial phenomenon and notions of psychological rootlessness. The epicenter of the, Salton, uh, of the nether zone is the Salton Sea. 
and uh, the Salton Sea is the largest lake in California. It was formed by an engineering disaster. In um, 1901, uh, some land developers decided to capture 90% of the flow of the Colorado River before it reached the border with Mexico and used that water for um, uh, farming in uh, the Imperial Valley um, so that they could grow more oranges and grapefruits. And in 1904, the, uh, it was a really wet year and the river um, was just raging. It jumped out of the canal and it busted through the control gates and it flooded into the lowest part of the land there, which was an area called the Salton Sink. And for 18 months, they couldn't control this flood. So the water from the river just kept flowing and flowing into this um, a low, depressed um, area. And uh, eventually, they, were, um, they controlled the flood. Then in the 1950s, another generation of land developers thought, well, what are we going to do with this lake? You know. And they thought, oh, this is great. We'll build another Vegas. You know, the, the Los Angeles um, rat packers, um, you know, have to go all the way to Vegas, and why not have them come to the Salton Sea? So they designed all of these communities and built roads and foundations, and they, try, they sold lots there. But um, uh, this is it from the air. As you can see, there's very little development. There's a whole city there, but very little people, very little buildings. It's a place where utopian dreams and dystopic disasters coexist. It's a natural history of discontinuity. And um, you can see here, there's the Salton Sea Test Base on one side, Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge um, on the other. The lower half of the Salton Sea includes the Chocolate Mountains Aerial Gunnery Range uh, and the Salton Sea Naval's Weapons Test Base. Uh, now abandoned, this uh, test base was used as a bombing range since 1939 uh, when it was transferred um, to the Manhattan Engineering District of Los Alamos National Labs for high altitude tests of inert atomic weapons. There were 150 drops per year that were made um, uh, with a peak of 223 in 1952. That was the peak of the testing down there. And um, until recently, the labs didn't disclose uh, this information. Now, interestingly, it overlaps its boundaries with the um, Salton Sea Wildlife Refuge, which is now called the Sunny Bono Salton Sea. I kid you not. The Sunny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge, named after the late pop icon um, of Sunny and Cher fame, uh, who became um, a, a politician in California. He came up with this concept that he called Bono Vision. Again, I'm not kidding you. A strange choice of words that describes maybe a porno film rather than an environmental outlook. But it actually was an environmental outlook. And he wanted to found uh, this as a preserve at the Salton Sea. Um, in the 1990s, catastrophic fish and bird die-offs began to occur. And... Um, these were triggered by various environmental stressors. Um, uh, there were um, certain days during the summer when the temperature of the water raises. Hot water holds less oxygen than cold water. The salinity of the lake now is 25% higher than the Pacific Ocean. And so literally millions of fish die um, sometimes in a day. And the, the peak was 7.6 million fish in one day. That was in August 1999. So what happens? You know, it's become a bird, migratory bird stopover. So the fish eat the birds, right? So then the, the bird, I mean, the birds eat the fish. <laughs> and the, the birds then die off from things like avian botulism. So it's really kind of a mess down there. So can this confounding history of an accidental lake somehow be brought into alignment with the systems of real life that use it? And um, every stretch of land has a narrative folded into it. And somehow this story of the Salton Sea psychologically or emotionally collides with my own story. Past and present and future 
collide, creative challenges in, you know, how do I deal with all of this information in, um, uh, in an artwork? And I think that perhaps because through future collaborations between artists and scientists, there may be some kind of a um, solution that can be found. Um, through this idiosyncratic variety of Baroque conceptualism, I throw into question the signifiers of art, not necessarily to suggest that my art lay in my gesture alone, rather than its material form, but to disclose the rigidity of thinking that can be associated even with creative endeavors, such as the visual arts. The themes drawn through the entire content of this project from the conflicted identity of E. Ficio to the subject matter of his artwork and the manifestations of societal intolerance of difference question our expectations. By employing absurdity and humor rather than summoning a note of despair, frustration, or refusal, I hope to send a message that the energy expended to construct meaning in our lives is an arduous and wondrous experiment with unpredictable results. And uh, I'm just going to show you one last slide here. And this is one of Yves Fusio's uh, projects that he was um, working on in the 1960s. It's a floating remediation plant for the Salton Sea to deal with what he saw as some of the potential environmental hazards um, uh, and part of what the problem is there is all those fertilizer salts and, and um, uh, herbicides that are used in agriculture down there flow into the Salton Sea. There's no outlet and there's no fresh water coming in. So it just kind of get, keeps getting messier and messier down there. So, um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Thank you.